So chapter 12 is about Gregor Mendel's experiments, and Mendel is sometimes called the father of genetics. Um, he did specific experiments to try to figure out how heredity works. When we're looking at his experiments, though, now, really what he figured out are the things that we now already know, which is that there are genes on chromosomes, and the chromosomes are segregated and passed to gametes, and then when gametes fuse together, those chromosomes become part of the new zygote, the new organism. And so when you're, when you're looking at Mendel's work, don't expect it to be complicated because it's really based on things you already know about, but he was working at a time when nobody knew about chromosomes, nobody knew about meiosis, and so they had some weird ideas, I guess, at the time, I guess they weren't weird, but they had ideas about how heredity might work, and so that was the environment that he was living in, and so he, the only way that he could figure it out would be to mate organisms together and then look at the offspring and see what you know, how they looked, and he couldn't actually look at the cells, he couldn't test the DNA, none of that technology existed, and so he would just have to try to figure things out based on um, crossing organisms and looking at their offspring, and so that was what made what he did special, because he was able to figure out things that are still considered correct, and yet he didn't know about chromosomes and he didn't know about meiosis. And so when you see what he did, um, it's more with an appreciation of how he was able to figure out some things that we now take for granted because we know about cell division and we know about how chromosomes are segregated, and, and he didn't. Also, his experiments, he did things in a very certain, in, a, in an exact way, and so there's some terminology that applies specifically to Mendel's way of doing things, and so we'll be learning some of that terminology. So in, up until the 19th century, so that would be the 1800s, it was believed that traits the actual physical trait was passed from parent to offspring. Now, what we know now is that the traits themselves aren't passed, but the, the genes encoding those traits are passed on the chromosomes. And so when, when somebody says, oh, you and, you and your dad have the same eyes, mm -hmm. it's not that a little piece of his eye actually went into the sperm and was passed to you. It's that the genes encoding the the traits or the gene yeah the genes encoding the the features that led to that structure or that shape of the eye or that color of the eye those genes were also passed to you and your cells expressed them in a similar way but until the 19th century they actually thought that like pieces of that person were actually pulled into the gametes and they really didn't have a such a concept of gametes themselves but they knew that something was coming from the body that then grew into the next individual. So people thought that the traits were kind of pulled in through some kind of body fluid. They called them humors. Um, but it's some sort of body fluids they thought would, would like meet together, like paint mixing together. And um, so they didn't have a concept that there was some kind of particle, which we would now call the chromosome. Um, and, and that's really what Mendel showed, was that there was some kind of solid particle, chromosomes made of DNA, um, that is actually passed from parents to their offspring. And that was a picture of Mendel. There aren't very many pictures of Mendel, so you tend to see the same ones. If you study genetics, you see the same ones over and over again. So Mendel, um, his... His given name was Johann, but when he became a monk, he chose the name Gregor. And so we call him Gregor Mendel. He lived in what is now Czechia, 
which is spelled, if I can spell it, CZ, I think, Chechia, Chechia, which used to be called Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic. So you might re recognize those. Now it's a, a separate country called Chechia. And unfortunately, there's another country called Chechnya, but that's, that's, that's not the same. But in any case, he lived um, what is now what is now Chechia. And so, you know, we're talking about Eastern Europe. Um, and he lived in a pretty small city called Birno, uh, which is still there. And he, it's a, it was a rural town. Now it's a medium-sized um, city, but at the time. And he, he was a monk when he decided to do his pea plant studies. The interesting thing about Mendel was he really wanted to be a, a high school, what would be the equivalent of high school um, physics teacher. And twice he went to Vienna, I'm pretty sure it was Vienna, Austria, to, to try to pass this entrance exam or this um, test to become a physics teacher. And uh, the first time he failed it, um, and they said he just didn't have the, he just didn't have what it takes to be a, a physics teacher. The second time, I'd, I think he got there and decided not to even try to take the test again, and if I remember correctly. But so he 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 did not become a physics teacher. But he was he was good in science. He was good in math, and that really showed when you look at what he did with the um, with the studies of pea plants. Why he got interested in this, I don't know. Um, he, there was already some work being done with pea plant genetics, you could say, crossing pea plants and looking at, at the offspring. Um, and that was already being done, so he got interested in that for some reason. Uh, in a rural area in Eastern Europe, apparently you could get plenty of different types of pea plants. So lots of pea plants were available. They were small enough and easy enough to grow that it made them a reasonable organism to study. If you were doing it today, I don't think you would choose pea plants, but um, in the, at the time it was a reasonable choice. They grow fast enough. I mean, not, you know, it takes a, a month or so to see what your offspring are going to look like, but, it, you know, you could get a couple of rounds of research done in a season. He worked, I think he worked for like 12 years on this, on this whole question. So it wasn't something he just did over one summer. It was 12 years or maybe 13 years where he worked on this. Um, he figured out, well, he, he used what was already known and also came up with some of his own ideas to self-fertilize and cross-fertilize the pea plants. Now, pea plants make flowers and the flower has... A part of the flower has the pollen, which is the sperm, and then the ovary, which contains the eggs. And so, um, so he had, like I said, he had a certain way of doing his experiments. And scientifically, it was very sound. Not much was known about genetics, but he followed a very um, methodical approach. And first thing he did was to identify and confirm that plants that he was going to use were what he called true breeding. And true breeding in a plant would be what would be equivalent to what we would call like a purebred dog. In other words, in a plant, if you take, if you have a, a pea plant that always makes purple flowers, and by the way, all the flowers on the plant would be purple the way it works with pea plants. And if you self-fertilized it, meaning you put the pollen on its own eggs, it that forms a, a seed. And then if you plant the seed, then when that plant grows up, um, it's the offspring of the, the parent plant. And if that plant had purple flowers, and if he did that over and over and over again, and all of the offspring plants of the self-fertilizations had purple flowers, then he would say, okay, this plant is a true breeding purple flower plant. 
And so he had to test each plant. He had to self-fertilize them, plant up a whole bunch of seeds, and make sure all those grew up to have the same trait. And then he would say, okay, this plant is true breeding for purple flowers. Maybe he had another plant that was true breeding for white flowers. He, he studied different traits. Um, he studied plants that had yellow pods or green pods, yellow peas or green peas, tall plants, short plants, what, what you would call dwarf, very short plants. So different traits, but he, for each one, each plant, before he really used it in an experiment, he pre-tested it to make sure it was true breeding. So that was a whole lot of growing of, of offspring plants just to confirm the ones that were true breeding. Any plant that did not produce all offspring of the same type, he threw out. He threw out all that. He only kept the ones that were true breeding. That was the first step. That probably took a while for him to do all that. Now, number two, once you have a plant that's true breeding for purple flowers, let's say, and you have another plant that's true breeding for white flowers, for example, you can cross-fertilize. So cross-fertilize means you take the pollen, let's say, from the purple flower plant, and you put it on the egg chamber of the white flower plant. Or you could take the pollen from the white flower plant and put it on the eggs of the purple flower plant. Either way, he would do both, both of those and that would be a cross fertilization. And then he and then after the fertilization happens, each of those fertilized eggs becomes a seed and each of the seeds has to be planted in the ground and grown up. And so those offspring are called hybrids. So the hybrid offsprings um, would be grown. And so that would be the first cross. So he would take two true breeding strains and he would cross them and then he would grow the offspring, the hybrid offspring. Then he would self-fertilize those hybrid offspring once they had grown. He would self-fertilize them, not cross-fertilize, but self-fertilize, and then gather the, the seeds that formed from that, and then plant those up and count up and, and grow those offspring up to see what they looked like. All right, so here's a picture that shows this design, and we use some terminology just to make it easier to refer to it. Okay, so like I said, you could have a true breed, and by the way, he already had tested the true breeding plants, so that's, that's a given. So he would take one true breeding plant for purple flowers, one true breeding plant for white flowers, or it could be a true breeding plant for yellow pea pods and a true breeding plant for green pea pods, whatever the two versions are and then he would cross them. Now those plants, those plants themselves are called the P generation plants, the ones that were true breeding. Those are, in Mendel's language, that's called the P generation. We don't usually use this, this language anywhere else, but in his cross, because he always did it in a certain way, we can, we can assign language to it. So the P generation were the true breeding plants that then he cross fertilized. And so he put some pollen from the purple flower onto the white flower or vice versa. And then he collected those seeds, planted them, and they grew up. And those seeds, now they didn't just have one, but they only show one in this picture. Because when he grew up those hybrid offspring, and those hybrid offspring are called the F1 generation plants, those all look the same. And in the case of the purple flower cross with the white flower, all of the hybrid offspring, all of the F1 plants were purple. They weren't light purple, as if it had been a mixture of purple and white. They were dark purple like the one parent. And so all of the F1 plants always looked like one of their P generation parents and not like the other P generation parent which was kind of interesting. Because you'll remember that Mendel was living in a time where they really thought that things were blending like paint. And so he probably expected to get kind of a light purple. Or when he, when he, when he crossed a pea generation plant that was green pods to a pea generation plant that was yellow pods, when he crossed those, when he mated those together, he probably expected to get an F1 generation group of plants that were 
kind of greenish yellow pods. But that never happened. He never saw that, that sort of paint blending effect. He only got offspring that had one clear phenotype. Phenotype means how it looks. And not the other, nothing showing from that other parent. So that was an interesting result for him. All right. So, so the P generation, you cross those two and you get offspring that are called the F1 generation. When the F1 generation is sexually mature, he self-fertilized it. So I show this arrow that kind of circles back on itself. That means self-fertilized it. So put the pollen of this purple plant from the F1 generation back onto its own eggs and then got the seeds that formed from that and planted all of those. And this gives you an example of one of his results. And the offspring of that self-fertilization are called the F2 generation plants. And the F2 generation plants, you can see here in this experiment, he did almost, well, 929 um, plants. But a, a large number of them came out purple. And then another reasonable size group came out white. So the white reappears in the F2 generation, in some of the F2 generation plants. So these are just the results he had. But what's important is the pattern, how he set it up. He always set up two true breeding plants. He cross fertilized them. That yielded the next generation of plants called the F1, which are the hybrids. The F1 generation always looked like one of the P generation parents, but not the other. And then he always self-fertilized the F1 generation plants. And when he planted those seeds in the F2 generation, those grew up to have some that looked like the uh, one of the um, traits and some that had the other trait. So in this case, the white trait reappears in the F2 generation. All right. So that was his experimental design, and that he followed that pattern every time, no matter what he was studying. So what Mendel figured out from doing these kinds of experiments with different traits, but over and over again, he saw that it was reproducible. Um, he found that in each generation, no matter what, the P generation to the F1 or the F1 generation to the F2, the parents of each generation seem to be passing something, what he called factors, particles, what we would call chromosomes and genes, that they were passing something solid, some solid particle to their offspring. That the, whatever was being passed from parent to offspring was not liquid. There was no blending of liquids. And that was a big deal in the 1800s. Because um, like I said, the blending concept was a, really the one they really kind of believed in at that time. And you can kind of understand why. I mean, when two parents have a child, the child has a mix of traits. And it seems to be almost a blending of the two parents. You probably know some, some parents and their child that where the child looks like both parents, you know, a blending. I also know some children that don't seem to look at all like their parents, but that's, a, you know. Anyway, I, I think I can understand why the blending hypothesis, you know, was if you don't know anything about chromosomes and you don't know anything about cell division, then it seemed... It was, okay. But, it, but that's not actually what's happening. It's the chromosomes that are being passed to the, to the gametes, and then the, the fusion of gametes at fertilization creates the new individual, which has those same chromosomes. So each individual receives a full set of chromosomes from each parent. So you'll remember in humans, gametes contain 23 chromosomes. So a, an egg has 23, and a sperm has 23. And so when they fuse together, the new individual has a full set from each of the parents now together in that new individual. And that each, you know, if you have two copies of each chromosome, because you have two sets of chromosomes all together, if you have two copies of each chromosome, then you have two copies of every gene. So you have two copies of the gene for eye color, you have two copies of the gene for hair color, you have two copies of the gene for... 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it doesn't have to be true. It depends, but not both copies don't have to be the same. The the, the type of the hair color uh, that you got from your mother's chromosome might be different than what you got from your father's chromosome. They could be the same, or they could be different. And so he 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 Mendel did not come up with the the language that we use today, not all of it. But I'm going to show you the language that we use today because it makes more sense just to learn it, the modern language. And so um, a gene is a section of DNA on a chromosome that controls a general trait. And by general trait, I mean like eye color. An allele is the exact one. So you can have a gene for eye color, and everybody has two copies of that gene. But there's a blue allele, and there's a brown allele, and frankly, there's also a green allele, and so on. But an allele is the, the specific form, what we call the alternative form of a gene. So the gene is more general. The gene for, I'll go back to the P example, the gene for flower color, each P plant has two genes for flower color, and they can either be, two, both of them could be the purple allele, both of them could be the white allele, or you can have a plant that has one white allele and one purple allele. That's possible. And so an allele gets down to the exact version, the white or the purple. Whereas the gene, you wouldn't say, although people do say this, but it's not technically correct, you really don't say the gene for purple flowers. That's really the allele for purple flowers, and the gene is for flower color in general. So the gene is really, if we're really using the language properly, the gene is more for the trait as a general concept, hair color, eye color, flower color, height. But the allele gets more specific into what color it would actually be for that allele. So we use a, a language, a cell can be called homozygous. Now this, this is describing a whole cell or a whole organism, really. Homozygous means the cell contains two copies of the same allele, like two purple alleles for flower color, or two white alleles for flower color. And you guys know that all the cells would have the same um, chromosomes. So if one cell contains two purple alleles, then all the cells contain two purple alleles. Um, and so, or you could have two cells, a cell that contains two white alleles. That would be homozygous for the white alleles. So homo means the same, homozygous. So a cell is homozygous if it has two of the same alleles for a certain gene. Now you can't say that a cell is homozygous, period, because a cell ha is homozygous for the gene for um, flower color, but it might be heterozygous for the gene for pod color if that makes sense. So, you know, a cell could be have two copies of the purple allele, so homozygous for the flower color gene, but it could be heterozygous, that's the other term. The same cell could also be heterozygous having two different alleles for a, another gene, a different gene, like height. All right, so really we refer to homozygous and heterozygous for that, that word only refers to a one certain gene. You're homozygous for blue eyes, but you could be heterozygous for, you know, you could have one allele for red hair and one allele for brown hair. So each, each gene that has two copies in the cell could be homozygous or heterozygous. And one thing Mendel found, and he did use this language, this is one, one bit of language that he did create, the presence of an allele does not guarantee the expression of its phenotype. In other words, if you have a plant that has one purple allele and one white allele, then when you look at the plant, the plant is simply purple, not white. So we would say that the purple allele is dominant. It produces the, tr the observable trait a recessive allele is the one that's not shown in that situation. So if you have a plant that has one purple allele and one white allele, so the plant is heterozygous for that gene, and the plant looks purple, but not white, 
then the purple allele is dominant and the white allele is called recessive. So a dominant allele produces its, its trait if just one of those alleles is present. A recessive allele, which would be the other allele, produces its trait only if two of those same alleles are present. So in other words, to, to have a plant that's purple, that plant could have two purple alleles, since purple is the dominant, or it could have one purple and one white allele and still look the same shade of purple. But if a plant is white with white flowers, it would have to have two white alleles. So the, the rule of the recessive allele is two of those alleles have to be present in order for that trait to be observed. For the dominant allele, only one copy of that allele would be present. Now, you, you, you don't know ahead of time. I know people think that the darker color is always the dominant. That's not always true. It's more often true, but I can name several examples where the lighter color ends up being the, is the dominant allele in different things. So for flower color, purple is dominant over white. But in mice, I'll give you an example. In mice, there is a yellow allele that is dominant over the black allele, which is kind of unexpected. So dominance and recessives, you have to have, you have to take a, a true breeding white flower plant and a true breeding purple flower plant and mate them. And that way you know that the offspring have one of each of those alleles because one allele has to come from each parent. And then you look at the plant and you see that it's purple, only then do you know that purple is the dominant. It's not something you could predict ahead of time. You have to set up a cross to create the hybrid, the individual that's heterozygous, and then look at that individual and see which, which trait is showing. And that's the, that, that tells you which one is the dominant allele. So I've been kind of using some of this language down here. Genotype refers to the, the exact genetic makeup, the exact allelic content of a cell or of an organism. And this uses these terms, homozygous, heterozygous. So if I say something is homozygous for the purple allele, I'm talking about in the DNA, there's two copies of that allele, one on chromosome 3 and the other one on the other copy of chromosome 3. Phenotype, though, is the physical appearance. And so phenotype will always just use a simple term like purple, white, I'm right? Phenotype is just what something looks like. So sometimes phenotype, genotype is the genetic makeup, phenotype is the physical appearance, the observable um, trait. All right. I will only use the word trait with phenotype. I, I know sometimes people talk about genetic traits. I, that gets very fuzzy to me. When I'm talking about genotype, genetic makeup, I'm talking about the DNA, I'm talking about the allele in the DNA on the chromosome. If I say trait, I'm talking about how something looks, the appearance, the phenotype. All right. So I will be very clear about that and um, try to help you with that as well. All right, I'm going to take a break, and then we will start on the next segment with the principle of segregation.